You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcasts. I have Rick Andrews and Mark Sampson. Rick is the CEO of Azitra, and Mark is the Chief Scientific Officer. So guys, thank you for coming very much. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, delighted to be here. Great. Well, tell me, what's the mission of Azitra? What's the company about? Okay, well, Azitra is about address. It's a medical dermatology company, and we're addressing serious skin disease. We do that by combining convent, um, technologies based on repairing disease problems, but also using the microbiome to deliver those and add to the therapeutic benefit. What, what the premise of the company is based on disease, skin disease is often a combination of a disease, a defect in the skin, complicated by the microbiome. Well, we found that we can use the microbiome to not only reduce those complications, but also deliver the therapy. So it's that combination strategy that has been um, so powerful in our research to date. And in the next couple of years, we're going to see it in the clinic. We're pretty excited. So what, what are some of the, when you say skin diseases, what are some of the ones that you work with? And then we'll get into the microbial uh, method of assisting them. Okay, so so the key diseases, and, and, and I'll ask Mark to jump in here too, but the first um, disease that we're going to be targeting is a disease that's based on the, a missing protein. So this is Netherton syndrome. Netherton syndrome is an orphan indication where infants are born missing this protein, Lecti. Lecti helps regulate the rate of loss of skin. In the absence of Lecti, these children suffer terribly from skin loss. So we have found that we can take a normal microbial strain, engineer it to deliver that Lecti, and then bring it to the patient so that the patient has the missing protein. So it's a, pro it's a protein replacement strategy using a microbe that's normally present on the skin. That's our really important program. That program has additional indications down the road and possibly in things like eczema, psoriasis, even rosacea. So we're pretty excited about the potential there. Um, we also have a natural bacteria and staph epi, which has the ability to suppress the activity and, and the growth of Staph aureus. That has, Staph aureus can be very complicating in many, many disease states. So for instance, in chemotherapy, patients often have chemotherapy which damages the skin. EGFR inhibitors is a classic example of that. And in this case, if the, pre, if the Staph aureus presence, what happens is you get a very, very serious rash. So by a simple topical treatment, we can prevent the growth of Staph aureus and then and eliminate or reduce 
the severity of the rash. So those are the really big programs that are coming up, and then we see a big future. But uh, Mark, did you have any additional comments on that? I know you're you've got lots of things on your on 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 your mind, and you've got a lot of programs in development. Yeah, sure. So really, just to, first of all, to support what Rick said is that for us, it's just the ability to engineer strains to change the imbalance that occurs on skin to either uh, treat uh, infections caused by um, Staph aureus, which is a pathogen associated with a number of different skin diseases, but also the ability to also deliver that in combination with delivering a therapeutic pr- protein to actually treat underlying skin diseases. And, and, and as Rick said, an example of that would be Nettleton syndrome, which, which is a, you know, a serious skin disease which causes imbalance in, in the skin. And our goal is to take natural, safe, commensal organisms to deliver these proteins to treat diseases. Now, how do you physically actually do that? I mean, you, is it like a cream that you'd have to rub all over the skin, all over every part? Or can you locally apply it and it spreads throughout the skin? Yeah, yeah go so, ahead, so, Mark. Yeah, yeah so, so, so we've delivered uh, topical uh, formulations, which, which will deliver the, the, the strains uh, wh- where it's needed to treat the disease. So I could so for instance, know, put it on, like, on, my, good. on my arm, it will migrate to another part of my body or? It literally will migrate a long distance. Yeah, so as I understand the question, yes, you can target the, like, for instance, eczema uh, is not, you know, you, when, when patients have uh, eczema, it's often confined to different areas, so you can treat those areas. The same thing with what we call cancer therapy-associated rash. Those patients often have rash on their face, so you can target that rash directly and not have to do you don't you're not addressing a dressing it systemically you're doing a nice direct topical application to the area where the problem occurs oh i'm sorry i was i was caught up in your example of the the kids that had the protein that wasn't expressed and therefore they would lose skin that sounded like a systemic thing that's why i was asking but these examples make total sense but in that example what would you do yeah so 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 yeah, it was a little bit difficult to hear, so I'm just going to um, respond. You're asking about the Netherton patients. So these patients, um, as they uh, grow older, so in about 10% don't survive birth, but the others will survive. Their skin stays, but their skin is always thin. And they, again, have large areas over time where that loss of the skin becomes very severe, and you will treat those areas. Okay, I see what you mean. I had, I had misunderstood thinking that uh, how could you treat someone's entire skin if they had a problem? So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to treat the whole skin. You can treat the targeted area, and that's what's so important here. And, and um, you know, we're not, we're not going to – this isn't going to be a, a definitive long-term genetically engineering the skin. What we're doing is we're solving the problem for the patient in their problem area. So why would um, microbes that, uh, do the microbes produce the necessary substance or do they attack other microbes that are competing for that same patch of skin? Like what, what are some of the mechanisms by which this works? Yeah, actually what, you, what you've highlighted there is two, two of the mechanisms. So the, one of the first ones is that there's lots of competition for different microbes on the skin. We use a staph epi, which is a very normal skin organism. And that organism likes to live on the skin. Staph aureus is not a typical organism on the skin. And it takes advantage of skin damage, damaging in the environment, and it'll grow when the skin is injured or damaged or the pH has changed on the skin. And the, the staph aureus can take advantage of that and cause problems. By applying the staph epi, you can suppress the staph aureus activity. The second point is that you can then, with that same staph epi, deliver the protein. And that will deliver it deeper into the skin, and it'll deliver it continuously. So you'll have the availability of the protein that can fix the problem and the ability to ease the stress on the skin that comes from the natural commensal organism that we've selected. 
All right, that makes a lot of sense. Your, in your view, what do, what is the different areas of the skin look like in terms of their microbiome? Are there dozens or hundreds of species, or is it pretty threadbare with just a few that are responsible for most of the activity? Yeah, it's actually quite diverse. You get um, you get a variety. You get um, Staph aphi is one of the most abundant, and it ranges in the uh, twenty to thirty to forty percent range sometimes. But you get a you get a very diverse in a healthy microbiome on the skin, there's a diversity of skin, and you'll get maybe a million different bacteria per square centimeter of skin. And that's, and it's, and it's quite typical. In a dysbiosis situation, dysbiosis being that network is disrupted, and dysbiosis is when one strain, often a foreign strain, like Staph aureus, takes an abundant role, and that causes problems. And uh, I'm going to turn to Mark here because he's really my expert. I'll let Mark comment on that as well. Yes, yeah, so part, part of our mechanism of action that's fundamental, as Rick said, is to target, is to bring back balance to the skin so that the skin becomes healthy by basically by showing that our strains can outcompete harmful strains which, which cause dysbiosis and bring it back into balance. So it, it's that combination, again, of Treating the, treating, the, treating the disease by bringing balance and harmony to the skin and also then in combination with that, delivering specific therapeutic proteins to actually treat the disease. Do you think that um, problems are starting inside the body and then migrating out through the skin? Or do you think that the problems are happening where they're affecting the skin directly and the problem is just staying there? Yeah, you, I, you know, question? that's... a that's a really that's a really interesting question, and you'll see there's probably a combination. But go ahead, Mark, and then let me and then I'll weigh in. Yes, yeah, sure. So so so, so yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So when you think about certain diseases, for example, an example of that disease would be atopic dermatitis, as a, as a skin disease. You have a you have a an imbalance in the starting from the outside because quite often because the skin itself. Is, has a barrier dysfunction that's not functioning effectively or because of genetic reasons, the skin is, is, is not, not as effective as it could be at, at protecting the body. So therefore, what happens is you get this barrier dysfunction, which then allows certain strains and other allergens to actually irritate the skin and cause the skin harm. So our goal is to basically prevent those those harmful bacteria from caught driving a disease, but also to help repair the skin so that you, you repair that barrier dysfunction, which is part of the underlying cause. Okay. Yeah, and I think that that's a really, and, and what you see in the, in the EGFR inhibitors, these are those cancer therapy. This is, you know, it's an important and very effective cancer therapy. And there, but the skin has a lot of EGFR production and many EGFR receptors. When they're shut down, the skin is damaged. So that comes sort of from inside. The damage is generated by the chemotherapy agent itself, almost as a side effect of treating the cancer. And when that happens, the skin is damaged, and the outside world takes advantage of that. Makes sense. Right. Yeah. And I guess um, any insight into melanoma, for instance, or eczema? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, uh, you, you've asked a really, really important question. Um, we can talk a lot about eczema, and in about a year, we're going to talk a lot about melanoma. But mel we're going to hold on the melanoma question for a little while. There's some really sure. important information. There's some really exciting things happening in that space today. And there's some very important role, a very important role for the microbiome in, attra in attacking um, the uh, skin cancers, um, but but let's talk a little bit about eczema and 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 there's really two effects there that Mark's going to tell you about in just a minute. It's the barrier dysfunction from filaggrin deficiency, which is present in eczema, but it's also the inflammatory response that occurs with the Staph aureus. And there's two different approaches that can be used there. And uh, I'll leave. I'll let Mark talk about that. Sure. So, as, as, as Rick said, uh, one of the key uh, underlying causes of of eczema is the fact that you have this 
barrier dysfunction, which has caused and which has been widely reported by many different studies to be caused by a, a deficiency in in uh, filaggrin, which is a structural protein that's um, that's uh, important for the maintaining the integrity of skin. So because of that, you have allergens and bacteria which can access um, important inflammatory cells in the skin, which which, which then deri- uh, derives a inflammatory response, which then causes a um, which then causes damage and inflammation, which leads to to the underlying disease uh, and activation of not just what's called the innate, but also what's called the adaptive immune cells. So our goal using our um, novel strains, which secrete lectine, which is, as Rick said, is a protein that's that's, uh, by our staph epidermidis strain, is not just to help repair barrier dysfunction, but also to actually treat the underlying inflammation using our serine protease inhibitors, which can actually, has been shown in many different studies, to have an anti-inflammatory effect. So that combination of, 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 of repair, you know, helping to uh, prevent the uh, pathogens from entering into, into skin, repairing integrity, and also actually treating the underlying inflammation associated with the disease. So why, um, you know, in an example like this, why bacteria? Do they just have a longer residence time on the skin? Do they feed off? elements that are on and around the skin and that well helps them perpetuate the the necessary compounds that they're creating you know versus just yeah. a you know an inorganic cream or something or an organic cream with that with no bacteria in it yeah that again a good question this is this is sort of something i don't think the public really understands is there's a lot of bacteria that live on our skin many many of these species the predominant amount of them are actually very good for us. There's a good relationship between those bacteria and our and our skin. And that bacteria grows on our skin. It lives on the skin and actually can get just below the, 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 the top surface of the skin. So it's part of our world, it's part of us. And it is that understanding that's come through in the last, I don't know, I'd say, last 10 years it really became known but in the last three to four it's really been well understood how critical that bacteria can be for our systems and how we behave and how we act and how we react to the world and so it's 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 there it's and and you can and what we've discovered is that you can also use it and make it even more potent and more useful does that help yeah that helps have you guys tried uh, fun experiments like sampling under the left armpit versus the right to see if there's different bacterial colonization or the left ear and the right ear? I've always wondered if uh, there's a big difference between the two. I don't know if you've ever looked at that. But, you know, you know, there's not you – know, we, you know, that's a good, interesting question. I know that different we, – we could look – Mark, you may want to comment here. I don't know. Um, we, we haven't looked carefully at one side versus the other. We know that it's very diverse. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say the answer is in the short term, no. We haven't we haven't looked specifically left versus right. But as Rick said, it's very diverse. But the bottom line is your, your skin and my skin and Rick's skin all all has um, has a is you know in no, a normal patients the actual microbiome plays a very important role working in tandem with the immune system to help protect against infection and to protect against pathogens. And really, when you look at something such as skin diseases such as Netherton syndrome or atopic dermatitis, here you have an imbalance. So that balance that we all have, you know, in our, in our, normal, in our normal skin has changed. And that imbalance leads to the fact that you now can have these pathogens such as Staph aureus, which can then colonize. And so our goal, one of our goals is to really, is to reset that balance so that our skin can work and our skin microbiome can work in combination with our with our natural immune system to help protect against pathogens and harmful bacteria. When when you look at a localized condition like eczema or others, um, are the pathogenic bacteria always there, just in low numbers, but they're they become a lot greater 
when a dysbiosis occurs or are they are they absent and they're only there when a dysbiosis occurs yeah that's a, again a good question yeah they're 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 around right the the these pathogens staphylococcus is, is abundant in our world um often in the nasal ca- cavity sometimes in the sinuses and those are you know one of the reasons i think that you'll see the cancer therapy patients often having so much difficulty with their rash, that rash normally occurs right around the face. So not only is it a bad rash, it's in the worst place. Um, and and it, it, it's because Step Aureus is there and it takes advantage of the environment. And what we're kind of, what we're going to do is deny that environment to it so that it can't take advantage of it. So since everyone's different, how do you know, how many, you know, what types of bacteria to apply, um, I mean, how do you how do you personalize this for people, or does it not have to be personalized yet? It's working across you know a whole bunch of different people. Let's say to treat eczema. Yeah, the the personalization. So 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 you look at the common species. Okay, um, there's Staph aureus is quite common on almost everybody, um, and the isolates of Staph aureus may Staph epi may vary by individual, but there's almost everybody has Staph epi. So what we've done is used a staph epi that's quite common, quite typical, quite safe, and um, and it it would then be able to address the challenge. Again, we're not trying to recreate a normal bacteria, a normal microbiome for each individual. That's a very difficult challenge. What we're trying to do and what we're directing our program at is fixing the challenges that come from dysbiosis and fixing the underlying disease problem. So we're, 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 we're not taking on that global challenge of fixing the microbiome. We're taking on the challenge of ameliorating the adverse effects of dysbiosis and disease processes. And if we can achieve that, we can keep our patients happy and, and under and in, in, in a much better health, and that's our goal. I guess another reason that's good is that, you know, um, with, you know, let's say I have some kind of condition, I take a pill that affects me, you know, either positively or negatively. But with skin, if someone has a topical cream and then they're in contact with family members or other people at work or whatever, you know, if that cream, uh, it, it could help the person that's using it, but maybe it could adversely affect others that, you know, get that cream on them somehow handshake, uh, whatever it is, you know, a doorknob, um, you know, so I guess there's, there's probably more to it than just fixing the person, but also making sure that it wouldn't negatively affect others. Uh, that's a, again, you're, you're hitting the key points. For instance, our cancer therapy um, treatment, we use a strain in this treatment that is an oxytroph, basically. And what that means is the strain we that we have engine we have engineered the strain so that it can't survive in the normal environment can only survive in our formulation so it's only while it is being used on a daily basis that the that the patient can benefit from it and then over time that strain can't survive so it's not going to pass from patient to patient. It's not going to get free in the environment. Now, it's safe anyway, and we do comprehensive safety studies before we do anything with a human. But at the same time, we make sure that that strain can't get free into the environment by controlling it that way. Yeah, I mean, even locally, someone has eczema and, you know, they lay in bed every night and they've applied the cream. You know, you wonder, like, if the cream now is on the sheets and the sheets aren't washed every day, let's say, or even if they are, what if the cream stays resident and gives them a higher dose than anticipated because it's there even when they're not using it or, you know, touches other areas of the body you know, where it wasn't intended? I guess uh, you guys have to do a lot of careful engineering to account for effects like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you have to count. You have to figure, figure out exactly all those issues. You got to figure out what the potential dosing would be, what the residual would be how it can spread, can it survive in the environment? Our strains don't survive well in the environment because of that competitive thing. But again, we build strains and the delivery of our 
proteins that have a very high therapeutic index. And then we keep the doses just enough to deliver it. So, so this, that's what the safety studies are about. That's what the FDA has asked us to deliver. And that's what we're committed to delivering is to make sure under all of those conditions that what we're giving the patient is something that is safe. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I guess as they come up in my head, I'm bringing up the issues that I'm, oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah. I know that you've, you've thought of them and all the safety protocols account for them, but uh, I guess they're just coming into my mind as I, as I think of them. So that's why I ask. Any, um, yeah, no, I think it's important. It's important stuff. We think about survival. We think about movement. We think about transition. We think, and we study it. So that's our, that's our job. Yeah. Any other, um, I don't know, in doing this research and this work, anything that you've learned that really just blows your mind about the microbiome on our skin? Any specifics? Uh, yeah. Every day. Every day something blows my mind. It, it, it is really amazing. And um, the the... And I think we are only on the beginning or the first step of understanding where this can go, whether we can evolve or en engineer strains that can help us fight off or resist mosquitoes that have that vector disease. The microbiome plays a role in both attracting and repelling mosquitoes. So can we, can we, fix that in such a way so that we can provide a strain that will help us resist mosquito bites. That's one of our pro one of the programs that we're thinking about doing some work with the uh, with the uh, federal government on and grant program. We also think about um, and I think the you know you touched on it earlier skin cancer the relationship between the microbiome and skin cancer the researchers and the scientists that we work with outside of the company are really exploring some amazing things that are going on with how you can use that bacteria to kill cancer cells or prevent metastases. So this is an exciting time for the microbiome, and our goal is to stay on top of it. I mean, yeah. Mark, you, you think about this all the time, so uh, where do you I, see I the future? I mean, I think it's very exciting. I think when you look at the microbiome, it's, it's, you can look at it as being the next generation of, of, uh, of treatments for some very serious diseases. And, and you, know, and the, you know, when you think about the role of, of microorganisms, whether those are in your, you know, in your gut or on your skin, and the role of those microorganisms in disease, and how you can use microorganisms then to treat diseases, it's a very, I think it's a very exciting area. And along with gene therapy, these are two areas that I would say are on the cutting edge of, you know, future directions, you know, as opposed to just having a harmful chemical to um, treat um, inflammation. Here you're basically using, you know, a bacteria to deliver something safely and also using the bacteria as, 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 a, as a vehicle to help naturally prevent disease. I, 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 for me, it's a very exciting area. Okay. Um, anything that you can uh, mention that's coming in the next six months or a year? Any new products that uh, you know have made a step forward? Well, yeah, I think we've I think we've talked about the key products. But what's really going to happen in the next year for us is clinical trials. So we we've gotten to the point where the company has done the kind of fundamental work with the manufacturing and the quality manufacturing, the formulation development, strain development and invention, and understanding of disease process. So we expect to be treating patients under it who, have, who are experiencing EGFR inhibitor therapy. So these would be chemotherapy patients uh, this year. We also expect to be moving into uh, patients, the Netherton program, uh, later this year. And finally, by the end of the year, we hope to be additionally treating the eczema patients. So it's a big, big year for patient therapy related to the microbiome. Excellent. And what's the best way for people to learn more about Azitra? Well, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to be updating the, the website on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, there's always a uh, info uh, 
message that the people can reach out, we typically respond. We actually do get some patients who have Netherton syndrome and often often communicate with, with parents. Um, but we're happy to speak to people. We do speak at a number of conferences uh, on the microbiome as well as medical dermatology, and we'll be doing more of that. And uh, very soon there'll be some additional scientific journals that, where we're going to be doing publications. So our outreach is beginning and, uh, and growing all the time. Excellent. Well, Rick and Mark, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Thank you.